Hello and welcome to the second installment of my Pokemon Generation 3 ROM hacking series. The focus of this tutorial is to demonstrate how some of the lesser known movement permissions can be used to contribute more to the diversity of our maps. This video will be broken down into the following segments. What exactly does each movement permission do? What are some instances in which I would use these permissions? And how do I connect one map to another? Following these segments will be an application demonstration. In this final part, we will be creating a new map that incorporates some of these lesser known movement permissions using the skills we've acquired from this tutorial. If you open Advanced Map and load the movement permissions, you'll notice that the three permissions we talked about in the first tutorial are only three of many. While not much is known about every one of these permissions, some of them do actually have uses that you may see once in a great while. We're going to start at the top of the list at the blue zero and end at the bottom of the list at the teal 3F. To begin, we have Permission 0. This is used on tiles that serve as an elevation manipulator, such as stairs. This is the only permission that allows the player to cross from one elevation to another, which is a concept that I'll cover very soon. Permission 1 is used on impassable tiles such as trees, mountainsides, and houses. Permissions 2 and 3 are ambiguous and don't have any specific usage that we know of. Permission 4 is used on surfable tiles such as ocean water or waterfalls. Before I move on, we need to go over the concept of elevations. Not every map in the game is flat. We have maps that consist of mountain ranges and maps that contain bridges hovering over cave terrain and water. In order to accommodate for these designs, elevations were created. There exists 13 heights in the game, allowing for 13 different elevation levels. So if we have a map that has 13 different elevations on, say, the back of a mountain, we can use the 13 different heights to allow the player to run along the spine of the hill without being able to walk north or south, since the player cannot cross between the different elevations without first stepping on a Permission 0 tile. This brings us to the remaining permissions. Permission 5 is used as an impassable tile on a height of 0. Permissions that are described like this one are really strange in that if the player really is on an elevation of 0, you can still use a standard Permission 1 to indicate an impassable tile. Not only that, but these impassable height-specific permissions aren't even height-specific. If the player is walking through an elevation of 2 and runs into an impassable tile of height 1 or 3, he or she won't be able to pass through. This basically renders all of these impassable height-specific permissions useless, but I'll mention them anyways. Permissions 6 and 7 are ambiguous and don't have any specific usage that we know of. Permission 8 is used as a passable tile with an elevation of 1. Permission 9 is used as an impassable tile with a height of 1. Permissions A and B are ambiguous and don't have any specific usage that we know of. Permission C is used as a passable tile with an elevation of 2. It's also the standard for passable tiles. Permission D is used as an impassable tile on a height of 2. Permissions E and F are ambiguous and don't have any specific usage that we know of. Permission 10 is used as a passable tile with an elevation of 3. Permission 11 is used as an impassable tile on a height of 3. Permissions 12 and 13 are ambiguous and don't have any specific usage that we know of. Are you sensing a pattern here? You should be. The permissions continue in this pattern for the rest of the list, going through every single elevation level, all the way up to Permission 3C, which actually has a really interesting effect. Permission 3C is used as a passable tile that the player can pass either above or below. This permission is dedicated to things like bridges. This way the player can walk both on top of the bridge and below the bridge. It can be kind of daunting to get bridge permissions to work properly, so we'll go over their mechanics very soon. The final three permissions, 3D, 3E, and 3F, are all ambiguous and don't have any specific usage that we know of. I want to put a few of these permissions to good use with some examples. On the screen right now you can see a map of a hill with stairs allowing the player to climb its varying levels of elevation. There is sufficient space on the ledges of each elevation for the player to walk around the hill on each level. As we map the movement permissions, it's clear that we've run into an unexpected issue with the spine of the hill. We want the player to be able to walk back there, but not be able to skip from level to level as shown on screen. This would be very confusing if it existed in the game. The good news is, we can fix this issue now that we have the knowledge of elevation movement permissions. Each level on the hill should be assigned a different elevation level. In addition, the stairs should be given a permission value of 0 in order to allow the player to cross from one elevation to another. The result of these changes is shown on screen. 
We can see that the player can walk along the spine of the hill on each individual level, but cannot walk from level to level unless he or she uses the stairs first. Pretty neat. The second example I want to show is focused on bridges. The map shown on screen is the main floor of Pokemon Emerald's Victory Road. This is one of the few maps that actually contains bridges, so it's a great pick for this example. Looking at the movement permissions, we can see that this map uses the passable C permission, the passable 10 permission, the impassable 1 permission, the elevation changer 0 permission, and the bridge 3C permission. If you recall, the 10 permission is of elevation 3, while the C permission is of elevation 2. Thus, we cannot cross between the two without using a staircase like the ones shown with a zero permission on them. That's all fine and dandy, and it should make sense to you so far. The iffy part of all of this is how exactly those three C tiles are functioning. The ends of every bridge are on elevation three levels, as indicated by permission 10. The grounds underneath every bridge are on elevation two levels, as indicated by permission C. Whenever we use a bridge on our maps, the ends of the bridge must be on elevation three, or the bridge will not work properly. The strange part is that the elevation of the ground beneath the bridge can be literally set at any level, as long as it's not 3. This can make for some awkward mapping, but it's a quirk that we've just got to get used to. There are some other nuances when it comes to bridges, but those are mostly related to getting your custom bridge graphics to work, and since we haven't gotten to inserting custom graphics, we'll leave it alone for now. We've finished movement permissions in their entirety. <laughs> Now we move on to map connections, that is, allowing the player to transition from one map to another just by walking between the two. It sounds easy, and thankfully it is. Let's use the connection between Pokemon Fire Red's Route 1 and Viridian City in this example. In order to see the current map's connections, click the four arrows icon in Advanced Map. We can now see some important information about each of the map's connections, including the connection ID, the direction in which the current connection is going, the offset value of the connection, and the map bank and the map number of the target map. Ignore the zero out box. If you scroll through Viridian City's connections, you'll see that it contains four distinct connections, the first being a junk connection that doesn't actually take us anywhere. For this example, we'll be examining the third connection. This connection has an ID of two and takes us to the northern end of Route 1. We can press the arrows in the connections window to traverse the region quickly. We can see that the direction of this connection is down, which makes sense since our player needs to go south in order to reach Route 1. Since Route 1 has a map bank of 3 and a map number of 19, these values also make sense. But what about the offset box? Why does it have a value of 12? If we traverse to Route 1 and check its Viridian City connection, we can see that it has an offset that is also 12, but this time it's negative. To explain this, we need to think about map dimensions. Viridian City and Route 1 do not have the same dimensions, so we can't just align them both starting at the very left of their boundaries. Route 1 is actually aligned near the middle of the southern border of Viridian City. This is where the offset value comes into play. In order to align the two maps correctly, we need to count the amount of tiles there are from the top or left of each map and then count to the bottom or right until we hit the tile that starts the connection. This probably sounds confusing, so let's go through together. In order to do this accurately, you'll want to turn Advanced Map's grid view on in the Settings menu item. The highlighted area on screen is where the connection from Viridian City to Route 1 is located, with the leftmost tile being the start of the connection. So, let's count the number of tiles that lead up to this leftmost tile. Starting from the left side of the map, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 tiles. If we do the same thing on Route 1, we can see that there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 tiles to the left of the starting connection tile. Using these two numbers, 22 and 10, we can figure out how to align the two maps. Starting in Viridian City, we know that there are 22 tiles of leeway until the connection begins. We also know that there are 10 tiles of leeway in Route 1 until the connection begins. So, if we take the 22 and subtract 10 from it, we end up with 12. This is the value that you see in the offset box. Transitioning to Route 1, we can do the same thing, only the numbers are reversed. 10 minus 22 is equal to negative 12, and that's the value you see in the offset box. 
That's about all there is to map connections. It's a pretty quick process, but it can be kind of tedious when you have some really big maps. That's everything I want to cover in this tutorial. Using the information we've learned throughout this tutorial, we'll construct a brand new map just like last time. However, this time we'll be using some new movement permissions and things like bridges. While I make this map in the background, I want to talk about a few things. I've decided I'll probably do an application demonstration like this after every tutorial so I can get this miscellaneous stuff out of the way without it being awkwardly shoved in the bulk of the tutorial. To start, I would like to thank all of you for taking an interest in my videos. Since my first tutorial was only uploaded a few days ago, I honestly didn't expect it to be noticed until several more tutorials down the line. However, in the past few days, my Poke community thread was approved, allowing members over there to get a glimpse of these videos. In addition, my channel got its very first several subscribers, which I wasn't expecting at all since I have literally only two videos up at the moment. The past two videos have gotten almost 40 views at this point, and in my eyes, that's a really impressive number for just starting out. Numbers aside, I wanted to thank all of you, and I hope you'll continue watching and giving me feedback to help my channel and the quality of my content to grow. I do want to give you a heads up about a future video I plan to make. Apparently I've already made two very minor mistakes in my first tutorial, but two mistakes nonetheless. I expect this to happen every so often, since my knowledge of some of this stuff can be rocky at times. Because of this, I'll eventually be making a video that covers all of the mistakes I've made for the past some number of tutorials in order to fix these errors. If you see or hear anything that is incorrect or hard to understand, please let me know and I'll be sure to consider going over it in that upcoming video. Also, if you have any suggestions for future topics, please let me know either in the comment section of the respective video or in my Poke community thread. That's all I wanted to say this time around. We're about at the end of creating this map. Everything that went into making this map has been taught to you through this tutorial. Hopefully you all learned something valuable from this, and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask either over at Poke Community or right here in my video comments section. Thank you so much for being my audience, and I'll be back in the third installment of this series.